I'm here with Dylan Smith of Vital Veda, who has his own practice down in Australia. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about what Ayurveda is, what he does and how it's different and how it can support us during COVID-19, whether you are a meditator or not. So let's start with the first question. What is Ayurveda? Ayurveda is a Sanskrit word. Ayur means life and Veda means knowledge or science. So Ayurveda is the science of life. What a broad and holistic body of knowledge. It literally has a say on everything. Everything. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the essence of Ayurveda is this science through this, this ancient sacred science is to attune you to live with nature. And when you live with nature, you live with your own human nature. And that's where perfect health lies. So when we align with these principles, these principles of Ayurveda, it's not, you know, rules or recommendations it's very specific. It's more principles adapting to your current state. You know, what are you, where are you living in the world? What's your climate? What's your habitat? What's your job? What's your schedule? What's your family life? And uh, what have you been brought up with? You know, what are you in, accustomed to? Using these principles, this is the beauty of Ayurveda and why it's a universal science. Some people say it's traditional Indian medicine, but it's not. It's, it's universal. It's just very strong in India. And it's adapting that to your current state, using the tools and techniques it provides through diet, lifestyle, herbs, treatments, so many practices, rituals. Then you attune to your own nature, to the cycles of nature. And that includes your own human nature. And that is where perfect health lies. So the essence of Ayurveda is attuning to nature, attuning to your human nature, and then enlivening perfect health. That perfect health is within everyone. We just have to enliven it and activate it and remind the body what it is to be healthy. Then the imbalances, the diseases will dissipate. And so there's no belief required to uh, practice Ayurveda. Like it's not contraindicated. It doesn't go against Western medicine in any way. No, no. The, it, um, it's actually very good to go with the Western medicine. Uh, it's not like you have to do one or the other. It's different, of course. It's more working on the prevention and, and working on the earlier stages of disease before they manifest. Only then will the Western medicine step in. This is the Shat Kriya Kala, the six stages of disease. The fifth stage is the manifestation. That's usually when the Western medicine will come. But there's four stages before which we can you know, intervene. And even the patient might not even know. Sometimes we feel the pulse and the patient mm -hmm. doesn't we see, feel something the patient isn't aware of that. We're like, actually, I can feel it coming. I'm seeing it very early. So here are some things to just prevent that and be aware of that. Um, so that's a wonderful, unique quality of the Ayurveda, especially if you have the pulse knowledge and can, and can go deep. And uh, you can definitely, alongside the Western medication, especially if it's a more you know deeper treatment like chemotherapy or surgeries um, definitely using the Ayurveda to support the body's ability to recover support the body's ability to prevent infections and uh, you know some of the detrimental impacts that can come with with these western interventions which of course in itself can be very beneficial and, and necessary um, so yeah this is this is definitely can be integrated and the wonderful thing about it is all the herbs and, and the protocols, even especially the herbs when we start getting a bit more advanced, they're whole herbs. So they will not contraindicate with the Western medications and the Western procedures. And they're not extracts. They're not you know, synthetic man-made supplements. They're like taking a food. So it doesn't mostly, of course there's some cases like similarly with foods that can contraindicate, but in mostly it doesn't. And it's very safe to take with it. Um, so, yeah. So it's an inclusive uh, practice. It's not excluding. You, can, uh, you can't do Western. You can only do it. It's inclusive. So it works with everything that someone's doing, even if they're in the West and they're prescribed uh, a medication for a serious uh, disease or something long term, maybe genetic, you know, born with diabetes uh, that, you know, requires insulin. What has been the greatest extreme, uh, let's say, condition 
that you've witnessed or experienced health from with your practices? I would say one thing that just came to mind is a lot of the gynecological disorders along with the women's health and seeing, uh, you know, really profound recoveries from, you know, having years, even over a decade of excruciating, debilitating period pain every month and then implementing these measures and, you know, really having even no pain and at all. And uh, that's your natural birthright. You should not have any pain during your period, but it's become the norm saying, oh, it's okay to have it. It's my period, but no, we need to distinguish between what's the norm and what's your natural birthright of health. So this is just one example of your natural birthright of health, which has now developed this norm, which is not healthy and not natural. So that, that, I mean, that helps. Why do you think that is? Is it because Ayurveda goes to more subtle layers that is miss, or because the Western medicine was primarily focused on the male anatomy and then the female anatomy was atypical and it didn't take the various variables that happened within the female physiology versus Ayurveda? I don't think it's male or female. There's uh, so many also male issues. Even the prostate is a very now increasing problem. The male infertility is very hugely uh, ridiculous. It's, it's increased in the past 30, 40 years, there's been a 50% decline in male sperm count and they keep reducing the, the sperm rates every year, like the normal range, because to keep up with this huge epidemic, absolute epidemic and another epidemic and what I see is infertility and it's huge and it's, it's and the and it's not just the women at all. There's fifty percent as the women, fifty percent is the men, and, and a lot of these these days is the men. So, yeah, that that's the, definitely the men as well. And uh, there was something you asked you asked later with that. Um, maybe the more subtle layers that I already yeah. can go to. Definitely. So that is also a very profound way of healing is tapping into these subtle layers of, of healing, because if we understand and whether you directly experience this or you intellectually can, uh, you know, recognize this and, and agree with this is that we all come from one unified field of pure absolute consciousness. And from this one unified field, we manifest into whatever our manifestations are, whether it's us as a piece of human flesh or it's a plant manifesting or it's a piano manifesting. It's all coming from the unified field of absolute pure consciousness. So if we can intervene on the subtle layers that on its way to manifesting, if we can tap into those layers before it's fully manifested, we can create profound healing because we're going more to the source of where it comes from. You know, we can, for example, with the Western medicine or other modalities, they may try to manipulate a certain hormone and activate a certain, you know, chemical signal and, you know, give this vitamin. It's like getting a tree and, and seeing some of the leaves of the tree are broken and looking brown and dead and trying to paint each leaf of the tree and, you know, go to the next leaf. And there's thousands of leaves. Like this is, if we can go more to the root, and not only the root, but the subtle roots. That's why these profound healings can happen and why these quantum healings can happen. And another thing as well as the gynecological issues is the terminal illnesses, the cancers. Seeing when the doctors, the, the oncologists are saying, you know, you can only live for a certain period and this is the only thing we can do, chemo. And we give them the treatment protocol. It's a lot of cases. I've been working quite a lot with cancer patients recently and and the doctors cannot believe how much the tumors shrunk and, and the results and mainly with the mind also is very playing a big influence in these patients when they have the good mind. And of course, that's where the meditation is. It plays a magnificent role and the meditation is one of the best interventions for health because it's one of the easiest ways to go into that absolute pure consciousness definitely aligning with the nature, living in true with nature's rhythms and cycles and taking herbs and eating with nature, you know, good diet, eating at the right times that also aligns you to that, to your true nature. But the easiest, most effortless way is to do meditation. So the meditation uh, that uh, we do, both do Vedic meditation, do you find that that 
actually works really well with people who are Vedic meditators and then they do Ayurveda? Are you uh, leaned? I would imagine there are various different branches of Ayurveda within itself. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your training and how it works in line with the meditation that we both do. Yeah, I think how it works with the meditation that we do is that we recognize or in the Ayurveda that I practice and that I, my teachers are practicing. It, it's all, you know, it's still all Ayurveda, but definitely some people are practicing. Uh, a lot of the Ayurveda has been misunderstood and confused and lost. And that is due to many reasons because of British invasions and Muslim invasions and... Uh, <laughs> Wherever and, uh, there's a mess in the world, it's all the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> not only that, it's just also, you know, people are misinterpreting the knowledge and not really understanding the true teachings. And, and uh, then they see, oh, because a doctor from, uh, a, 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 there's a book by a doctor and his name sounds Indian, means that is the be and all, you know, that's the teaching. But we need to really, I'm a big proponent on the pure teachings and the authentic teachings and going to what we call the Shastras, which is the classical text, which every Ayurvedic, physician who actually studies Ayurveda and has studied Ayurveda will know that those are the authoritative teachings. And as well as that, I also learned from a family of, of doctors, of Ayurvedic doctors that have been healing for many generations. And that only there's only a few in the world now that have that unbroken lineage of knowledge and that pure knowledge and that hasn't been lost. So by using this knowledge is one unique thing. And also, as you said, considering more the subtle, the subtle aspect of these medical interventions. And, you know, you can't just take a herb and dry it and then put it into a capsule and, and swallow it. Like there's so much more to it. How do you purify the herb? What month, what, what day do you pick the herb? At what time do you pick the herb? With what mantra do you pick the herb? With, with, you know, there's so much of these subtle, uh, aspects of, 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 you know, treatment that when you incorporate, it really amplifies the treatment effects without a doubt. And, and you don't have to believe in it. As you were talking before, do you have to believe? No, you just, <laughs> it's, it's science, it's natural law. So definitely the best is for a patient is to just surrender and not think much about it. Actually, we'd say you shouldn't think much about your health. Just do, if you have a good Vedya, a good Ayurvedic physician that you trust, just surrender and do what they say. It's, but why should we be thinking about our health so much? This is what, you know, th these physicians are there for. Unfortunately, in the West, we have to do the opposite. We have to be skeptical and question, is this really the appropriate medical intervention for me or is there other things I can do? But when you find a good health practitioner, an Ayurvedic practitioner, you can just surrender and not think about your health. You know, don't be thinking about your disease and Googling your disease and, you know, reading about it and talking about it and, just focus on your health and put your awareness on that. And then that will grow. So a lot of people it. get overwhelmed when they think I read it and they think of all these protocols that they have to do every morning. Is that really necessary when someone just wants to start? Are we going to be able to do some really simple uh, practices that would change people's um, initial shift in consciousness with Ayurveda? Yeah, as I said at the beginning, it's adjusting to what you, you know, what your current state is and what your unique individuality wants and desires and, and can integrate. So, you know, the, the knowledge is there, but again, it's not rigid. It's, you know, if it says do a self massage, well, if you don't have the time, there's a short version and there's the vital points and just getting, it's the principles of getting in that habit and routine of lubricating every day. And not doing these practices because we told you to, because I told you to, to your, because your practitioner told you to. <laughs> it's you enjoy doing it. So this is where, again, you can get a difference in Ayurvedic practitioners is they need to teach you about this, increase your awareness about it so you understand it, and then give you the tools to implement it into your life and experiment, start to experiment play with it, see how you can integrate it and feel the benefits and do it not because you think it's good for your health, 
you feel it and you want to do it. It's like having a shower and brushing your teeth. You know, I hope most people do that every day. And I, think <laughs> I, so listening- too. <laughs> and I think everyone listening here does it. So Ayurveda <laughs> says, <laughs> also, there's some other things we have to do, like putting oil on your body every day and, you know, waking up at a certain time. And why do we do it? This is what we will learn. Why mm-hmm. do you do it? How do you do it? What are the different levels you can do it and, and ways you can integrate it? Some days you might want to do it. Some days it's indicated to do more. Some days it's contraindicated to do it, so to rather rest. So learning all these things, becoming, you know, having the knowledge, then practicing it and experimenting with it, and then finding your unique way to integrate these practices into your life, which you enjoy. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing um, not only about the fun mantras that you're saying when you pick the herbs, but also <laughs> the simple, simple practices that people can do. Uh, You have such a vast knowledge and I'm looking forward to you being able to share to the meditators and non-meditators the truth 